بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين أجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف دليت علام رحمة الله عليه has collected some hadith about the verse 45 of Surah Baqarah وَاسْتَعِينُوا بِالصَّبْرِ وَالصَّلَاةِ وَإِنَّهَا لَكَبِيرَةٌ إِلَّا عَلَى الْخَاشِعِينَ In these hadith, Imams alayhi salam have introduced prayer and fasting as two means for achieving what you want, especially when you are faced with difficulties. For example, in a hadith which is narrated by the late Kulaini in Al-Kafi, Imam Sadiq is quoted as saying, Kana Aliyun alayhi salam idha ahalahu amrun faz'un qama ila salah. When something difficult was happening to Imam Ali alayhi salam, he used to go and stand for prayer. And Imam recited this verse, وَاسْتَعِينُوا بِالصَّبْرِ وَالصَّلَةِ So when you have difficulties, you can pray with the intention of asking Allah for help. In the same book, there is hadith which says, أَسْصَبْرُوا أَسْصِيَعُ And Imam alayhi salam says, إِذَا نَزَلَتْ بِالرَّجُلْ أَنَّازِلَةُ الشَّدِيدَةِ فَالْيَسُمْ if something very difficult, a calamity, a catastrophe, or a very urgent need happens to you, you should fast. And Allah Azza wa Jal وَاسْتَعِينُوا بِالصَّابْرَ And sabr means fasting. Of course, as we said before, this is an example for patience. Then there is a hadith uh, that... I may not agree with Allama Tabatabai in the way he interprets this hadith. He quotes from Tafsir al-Ayashi and Abul Hasan alayhi salam. Fil ayah qal as-sabru as-sawm idha nazalat bil-rajul as-shidda aw al-nazala fal-yasum. So something that we had before. Up to now, it's not new. Inna Allah yaqool وَاسْتَعِينُوا بِالصَّبْرِ وَالصَّلَاةِ وَإِنَّهَا لَكَبِيرَةٌ إِلَّا عَلَى الْخَاشِعِ Okay. وَالْخَاشِعِ What is new in this hadith is the interpretation of khashi'. Who is humble and actually can benefit from prayer and patience. الْخَاشِعِ الذَّلِيلُ فِي صَلَاةِ The one who when he says his prayer he is humble. His humbleness is obvious when he is saying his prayer. Al-Muqbilu alayha. He says his prayer with the eagerness and joy of the heart. He doesn't go towards prayer only with his body. He goes towards prayer with his body and heart. Al-Muqbil alayha. Ya'ni... رسول الله وأمير المؤمنين صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم and عليه السلام. Okay, here علامة says something that is not clear why he says this. After saying المقبل عليها يعني رسول الله وأمير المؤمنين علامة says أقوله قد استفاد عليه السلام الإمام عليه السلام understood from this آية uh, this verse that it is مستحب it is recommended to pray and fast when calamities happen 
Okay. Because you know that you cannot pray and fast without having a command. Yeah? For prayer and fasting, you need to have a command. And for <coughs> implementing or obeying that command, then you say, I am doing this prayer or this fasting. From this verse, we can understand that one of the commands is to pray or fast when you have problems. That's fine. Then Allah says, وَكَذَا أَتَّوَسُّلْ بِالنَّبِي وَالْوَلِي إِنْدَهَا He says, Al-Imam has also, has also understood that it is recommended to appeal to the Prophet and Imam salam when there are difficulties. And this is indeed the esoteric interpretation of sabr was salat. So asking sabr and salat for help means asking Rasulullah and Imam for help. I don't know how did he understood this from that hadith because this ya'ni doesn't refer to alayha al-muqbil alayha which is salat then ya'ni doesn't mean salat is rasulullah and imam ali this ya'ni rasulullah wa amirul mu'minin i think refer to khashi'in khashi' is rasulullah and amirul mu'minin it has nothing to do with tawassul so I am surprised. How did he understand? Maybe he has some reason that we don't know. But uh, this particular hadith doesn't mean that. It has nothing to do with tawassul. This hadith wants to say that the perfect example of the khashi is Rasulullah and Imam Ali. And this is why I said last week that we cannot say means the people who have suspicion. Because if we say it means that uh, these people have suspicion would not include Imam Ali, would not include Rasulullah because certainly they have yaqeen. If the meaning of yavunun is to have suspicion, then it would not include Rasulullah and Amir al -Mumin. You have to interpret Yabun Nun in the way that can include them. Indeed, they are the best example of Khashai. This is why it's better to say Alladina Ya'lamun or Alladina at least Ya'taqadun. Either they know or they believe. The minimum is to believe. Believe is compatible with certainty and also very a strong type of suspicion. Maybe 95%, 90% also you can believe. But it is just suspicion, 51%, 52%. This is not enough. Okay, so this point is something that I think it's not acceptable. There is another hadith which says, الَّذِينَ يَظُنُّونَ أَنَّهُمْ مُلَاقُ رَبِّهِمْ يَقُولْ يُوْقِنُونَ أَنَّهُمْ مَبْعُثُونَ وَذَنُّ مِنْهُمْ يَقِينَ So this confirms the interpretation that we preferred. And Ibn Shahra Ashub in his manaqib narrates from Imam Baqir alayhi salam that this verse was revealed in Ali alayhi salam and Usman ibn Mad'un and Ammar ibn Yasir and their friends. These were the people who were humble. Again, these people had certainty. These people were not thinking that maybe it happens, maybe not, but it is more likely. Okay, this is about the previous verse. Now we have two verses here, but the main one is the second. The first is, again, an address to Bani Israel. Ya Bani Israel, Exactly like the verse before. But the ending is different. 
على العالم. I raised you over the people, over the intelligent people, because alamin means the people who have understanding, those who have understanding. Ulul uh, It's wrong to translate the vaults. Many people say alamin is vaults. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alamin. They say the Lord of the vaults. Alamin is not the plural for Allah. Alamin looks like plural, but it's not plural. It means ulul aql. So it includes human beings, jinns, and angels. Allah says, I have raised you over alamin. In this case, it should be human beings and jinns. Why did Allah chose them and raise them over all the people of the world? I think it can be one of the two. Sometimes Allah chooses some nation because of some good qualities that they have. And as long as they have those good qualities, Allah keeps them in that position. If they lose it, he will take away the gift, the honor that he has given them. So they were pious people, good people, and Allah gave them a quality which is to be above others. So he treated them especially. When they changed, Allah took away. But maybe in this particular case, I am not saying definitely. The reason is not that they were very pious and very special. Maybe sometimes Allah gives you something for test. It's possible that Allah gives you something for test, not because you deserve it. But Allah wants to test you. Sometimes Allah chooses a nation, gives them a chance. And then if they do all right, if they do everything in a good way, Allah keeps it for them. If not, Allah takes it away. Uh, because it doesn't seem that Bani Israel... From the very beginning, they were very special. And then they changed. Yes, among them, there were very good people. There were many prophets. There were good believers. And that is helpful. But as a nation, I don't think that they were from, even from the beginning, they were very special and deserved to be raised over others. But this is my uh, just opinion. I, you can test and you know find you know some evidence against it or for it, accept it or reject it. Just I want to raise it as an uh, option. Why Allah chose them? Was it because they were very good people, or because Allah Subhanahu wa Taala wanted to give them a chance, especially because? There were many good people among them. There were many prophets. Indeed, maybe part of the treatment was Allah raised many prophets also among uh, the Bani Israel. Yes. The point that I take to put for you is that God Quran, we have this verse of Allah, the power of Allah, revealed Quran to Arabs. And it says, if he had revealed this to the other nations, Arabs would not believe in Quran. Yeah. yeah. They are not the best. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed, uh, we had a session last week about one of the, uh, you know PhD uh, thesis. One of the brothers argued that whenever there is a prophet, it means that there must be a kind of perfection, a kind of excellence in that nation. And he was comparing that to the coming of Imam Zaman. And he was saying that 
in the way that when Imam Zaman comes, uh, people must be very prepared, very, you know, good people must be there. In the case of the prophets also, there was something else. And I said, no, indeed can be quite opposite. Sometimes Allah sends the prophet, not because people are very good people, sometimes because the people are desperately in need. Like, for example, the way Imam Ali Salam describes the society before Islam. That society is not a society that is very pious, very good, very educated, and therefore they deserve this. That society is so desperately in, you know, mess that they needed this help. Of course, there must be a person who can be a prophet who would be able to fulfill that mission. But that prophet doesn't necessarily represent his nation. The nation was quite opposite to the prophet. So this is something that I think it's interesting if you make a kind of research. Why Allah chose Bani Israel in the first place? And what did they do later that they lost this honor? The second is easy. But the first one, why did Allah choose them in the first place? It needs more research. Yes. As you mentioned, they had lots of prophets. Yeah. So they had good properties to have lots of prophets. Comparing to Quraysh, they had in quality, in quantity, not in quality. They had more, much uh, prophets. So they had good. They, they were good. Yeah. But but to have many prophets, is it a sign of being good people? Yes. As a nation. Yes, because, because especially you especially when you kill seventy of them on the same day. No, no, because you are, you have, <laughs> you are you are good tribe. So among you, which we have chosen lots of prophets, these prophets are good. Yeah, we don't have problem. But I'm saying as a nation. As a nation. As yes. a nation, what the, were they special? So compared to Quraysh, for example. For example, I I, you we, we never have in the Quran that Allah has raised Quraysh over yeah, other people. No, no. Fazal to come is different. Ikhtara means Allah chose them so that he picks up Rasulullah from them. Yes, we have this, for example, that about companions of the Prophet. That man yartadda minkum and dine fasawfa ya'atillah bi qawmin yuhibbuhum wa yuhibbuna. From this, indirectly, we can understand that they were in good condition. And Allah is warning them that if you change and become bad, I will bring another nation. So it means that you are already all right. Yeah. But even for Muslims, we don't have such a thing that. Yes, we have. Kuntum khayra ummatan ukhrajat lannas. But that is different from fadlal tukum al alamin. That is more in a legislative way. Kuntum khayra ummah is legislative. Pardon? Yeah. This is another point that you have to. Uh, a study where this happened, when this happened, and where this happened, because Bani Israel are children of Prophet Yaqub, especially when they multiplied. Maybe not the first generation, but after a few generations, when they multiplied and they grew in number, they are Bani Israel. From which point in particular Allah raised them over other nations, we don't know. Perhaps with the kingdom of Prophet Yusuf, maybe that is a time that Allah showed a special treatment for them. But uh, I don't know exactly which time this happened. Maybe this is also what you can find. Which time exactly this happened. Perhaps it's not mentioned in the Quran, but maybe it can be. But it refers to Moses, that is. No, Moses came. Moses. Moses came much later. Yes, I know because these uh, uh, verses are but related the, when, to Moses. When, time. when was the beginning? Yes. The beginning can be before Musa. Yes, yes. 
key risk has a number of drop just profits or some other boundaries No, many things. One of the manifestation of that was perhaps that they had many prophets. But Allah helped them in many different ways. And how many, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mirac showed them miracles. Sometimes I have this uh, kind of feeling. Maybe it's uh, not scholarly, I don't know. But <laughs> I have this feeling that in the time of Bani Israel, it seems that the difference between the hidden and the visible was very little. Qayb you know, and Shuhud, it seems that at that time became very close to each other and they were easily shifting from Qayb to Shuhud. A story that happened to the Prophet Suleiman and other things, it shows that at that time there was no big distance and therefore much easier for, for people to become Prophet. When it comes to the time of our Prophet, it seems there is a big you know, distance between Ghaib and Shuhud. But maybe this is my just imagination, but there seems to be some evidence for that. Okay. The next point here is Shafa, intercession. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Bani Israel, Wattaqu yawman. In the previous verses, we had wa iyaya fattaqun, iyaya farhabun. But here Allah says wattaqu yawman. So perhaps one uh, type of having taqwa and protecting yourself against Allah's anger is to have fear of the day of judgment. Yeah? Iyaya fattaqun. Part of it is wattaqu yawman. لا تجزي نفس عن نفس شيئا. No soul, no person, no human being can suffice another one, can replace another one. ولا يقبل منها شفاعة ولا يؤخذ منها عدل ولا هم ينصرون. Basically. Every person is responsible for himself or herself and no one can come and rescue you or replace you or intercede for you. There is no possibility of replacement or receiving help or redemption. Say, okay, this person is instead of me. You can punish him instead of me. And no help. So everyone must rely on his own qualities and achievements. Okay? Like when you have exam. When you have exam, you can, if there is a proper exam, you cannot ask someone else to write for you the answers or send your brother instead of yourself. Or say, for example, to your mother, please go and, you know, do shafa'a for me. No, you have to yourself write the answers correctly. If there's a proper exam. This is definitely a proper exam. So everyone must be himself or herself able of giving right answers. Okay. Now... Alame has a discussion here to explain why it says there is no shafa'ah, there is no intercession. As you know, there are some people who are against shafa'ah. And they may argue from this verse that Allah says, La yuqbalu minha shafa'ah, there is no shafa'ah. So can we say that according to the Quran, there is no possibility of intercession? Or there are some conditions, some details. For this reason, <coughs> he starts a very scholarly and very 
profound discussion about Shafa. Ah. What is Shafa? Ah and what are the principles that you have to uh, consider when you are talking about Shafa? Ah? First of all, Allah says, in this world, when there is a king or a ruler in general, and he governs his country, his estate, or there are, for example, different powers, like you have judiciary system, you have uh, executive system, you have legislative system. They make laws, they ask people to follow them, and if you don't follow them, there are punishments. He says, in this world, sometimes if you break a law or disregard a law, you can bribe. You give some money and they overlook. Or you have someone who is very close to the king or to the judge and he goes and speaks and cancels your punishment. This happens in dunya. Or you offer a big gift and they will forgive you. Okay? Some religious traditions, especially the pagans, they had this idea that the hereafter is like this world. In the hereafter, also, you can solve problems by giving gifts or asking for help. Therefore, they used to offer lots of sacrifices to their gods. Or sometimes bury people with some gifts. Say so these gifts are to please their gods. Or sometimes even people were buried with horses and weapons so that when they are resurrected they can use those horses and you know weapons uh, and this was a mentality that even in akhira you can do what you used to do in dunya but according to the quran in the hereafter these things don't work you cannot get help from others you cannot solve problems by offering some sacrifices or gifts or by finding someone to intercede for you in the hereafter everything is based on reality qualities merits and your achievements if they bury with you millions of dollars it's not going to help you if they bury with you hundred soldiers they are not going to help you there is no such connection therefore allah subhanahu ta'ala in several verses says that in the hereafter the situation is different for example surah in fatar number 19 he is the one who has full control. He's in charge. And no one can interfere. You cannot bribe someone and then he solves your problem. He is in charge. In Surah Baqarah number 166. What does it mean? Means all the connections or all the causes will stop they will not work those things that in dunya sometimes they worked in akhira they don't work means those types of means and causes that they had now is not working uh, you may remember in the discussion about Velaya, we had this verse 
and some of you may not have heard that discussion, but some of you have heard. On the day of judgment, first people are resurrected as individuals. Okay, so there is no fard or zoe system as Tehran. In, in the Akhra, it's all fard. Everyone comes individually. But then what happens is Then people will be asked to join their leader. So we will have groups. Initially we have individuals. Then we will have groups headed by their leaders. Therefore, when they go to hell or heaven, they don't go individually. They go in groups. So, when you are born, you are not born in groups. Every person is born separately. Maybe you have twins, but again, it's individually. Everything that we gave you, you left it behind. You cannot take your money, your knowledge, your certificate, your children, your wife, your husband, your position, your house, your car with you. You have to leave it behind. وَمَا نَرَى مَعَكُمْ شُفَعَاءَكُمُ الَّذِينَ زَعَمْتُمْ أَنَّهُمْ فِيكُمْ شُرَكَا and we don't see with you those people that you thought they are going to intercede for you. Za'amtum. Th you thought that they are going to intercede for you. They will not be with you. There is no connection. Whatever you were thinking is lost. Okay? So... Those people or those things that they thought they are going to help them are not going to help them. So, Allah says, from these verses we realize that in the hereafter, none of the worldly, be careful, none of the worldly means and instruments would work. The things that work in dunya would not work in the hereafter. And so the worldly things would not work. The natural system would not apply to that world. And therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says... You cannot expect someone else to help you or replace you or do shafa'a for you. Then after that, Allah brings some other verses of the Quran in which shafa'a is confirmed. In these verses, in general, it is said neither shafa'a nor, for example, replacement or giving you know, money. These things don't work. But then we have some verses that confirm shafa'ah. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allahu alladhi khalaqa as-samawati wal-ard fi sittata ayyam, summa stawa ala al-arsh, ma lakum min dunahi min waliyan wala shafi. When he says, ma lakum min dunahi min waliyan wala shafi, it means that he himself is shafi. But other than him, you don't have Shafi. Or Allah says, لَيْسَ لَهُمْ مِن دُونَهِ وَلِيٌّ وَلَا شَفِي Or قُلْ لِلَّهِ الشَّفَاعَةُ جَمِيعًا In some verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, there are also other people who can do Shafa'a, but with his blessing, with his permission. 
فور اگزامپل من ذا الذي يشفع عنده الا باذنه اور ما من شفيع الا من بعد اذنه سو وین وی پوٹ آل دیز ورسز ٹوگیدر وی ریئلائز دیٹ ان سم ورسز اٹ سیز دیر از نو شفا شفا ڈزنٹ ورک ان سم ورسز سیز شفا بلانگس ٹو اللہ سم ورسز سیز دیر آر پیپل ہو کین ڈو شفا وتھ ہیز پرمیشن اوور آل کنکلوژن از دیٹ نو ون کین ڈو شفا ایکسپٹ اللہ اینڈ دوز ہو ڈیپینڈ آن ہیم So when he says there is no shafa'a, it means shafa'a independent from Allah. Okay? Shafa'a which is not accepted by Allah. That is not working there. But Allah himself is shafi. And also there are people that Allah permits them, lets them to do shafa'a. He says this is like what we have in some other cases. For example, about knowing the hidden, knowing Ghaib. In some verses, it says that no one knows Ghaib. Other than Allah, no one knows Ghaib. But in some verses, it says there are people that Allah has given them knowledge of Ghaib. For example, you know, Allah says, in one verse, Allah says, قُلْ لَا يَعْلَمُ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ الْغَيْبِ This denies. Or, عِنْدَهُ مَفَاتِحُ الْغَيْبِ لَا يَعْلَمُهَا إِلَّا هُو But also, in the Quran says, عَالِبُ الْغَيْبِ فَلَا يُذْهِرُ عَلَى غَيْبِهِ أَحَدًا إِلَّا مَنْ اِرْتَبَى مِنْ رَسُولِ So, Quran wants to tell us that no one independent from Allah can know غَيْب or can do shafa'a, or can do anything. Everything is in the hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but there are some people that Allah gives them this merit that they can do shafa'a, or they can know ghaib, and so on, and so forth. Then he has a discussion here. Why? Why Quran speaks in this way? Why Quran stresses on saying that everything is in his hand of Allah. No one can do anything independent from Allah. Allah says the reason is to teach us that Allah is the soul, is the only one who is in charge. And he is not restricted in his power. He is not limited in his power. He can do whatever he wants. And anyone else cannot do anything except if Allah permits him. And Allah refers to one verse that is very much discussed by ulama, especially in Chalam also. You know, about eternity in hell and heaven. You know, this is one of the very... Uh, I, I don't want to say controversial, but uh, it's controversial, you know, <laughs> that, <laughs> that would we have people who would f- eternally suffer in hell or not? Some people, they don't accept this, especially some mystics. They say, at the end, everyone will be forgiven. <laughs> Pardon? <laughs> yeah. Uh, So, one of the verses which has been discussed very much is this verse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Hud number 108, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajim, فَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ شَقُوا فَفِ النَّارِ لَهُمْ فِيهَا زَفِيرٌ وَالشَّهِيقٌ خَالَدِينَ فِيهَا مَا دَامَتَ السَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضِ I had a discussion with one of these people. And he was saying, look, it doesn't say خالدين فيها أبدا. It says خالدين فيها ما دامت السماوات والأرض. So, as long as there are heavens and earth, they will suffer. Not all the time. 
And even for them, Allah says, إِلَّا مَا شَاءَ uh, Except the people that your Lord wants to forgive them, then they would not suffer. They would not have this even limited, you know, presence. إِنَّ رَبَّكَ فَعَالٌ لِمَا يُرِيدٌ This is very important. إِنَّ رَبَّكَ فَعَالٌ لِمَا يُرِيدٌ He is not only فَعَالٌ لِمَا يُرِيدٌ He is فَعَالٌ لِمَا يُرِيدٌ You know, فَعَالٌ لِمَا يُرِيدٌ can be sometimes with a struggle. For example, you want to build a house, especially in such market, <laughs> It's very difficult. And you finally finish the house. But by the time you finish the house, you are yourself finished. <laughs> yeah? So, you are fa'ilun lema turid. But with difficulties. And the work has affected you. And you were at the edge. Maybe you were thinking that you were not able to finish. But Allah is not fa'il. He is fa'alun lema yurid. For him, everything is easy. Everything goes smoothly. So, إِنَّ رَبَّكَ فَعَالٌ لِمَا يُرِدُ وَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ سُعِدُوا فَفِي الْجَنَّةِ خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا Again, مَا دَامَتَ السَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضِ Normally, the assumption is that those who go to heaven, they go forever. Yeah? We don't have people who go to heaven and then they come out. Those who go to hell can be forgiven. After some time, they are forgiven and they go outside hell. But those who go to heaven, they go forever. But here says, مَا دَامَتَ السَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضِ إِلَّا مَا شَاءَ رَبُّكَ First of all, he says, as long as there is uh, there are heavens and the sky, and then also says, إِلَّا مَا شَاءَ رَبُّكَ it means that if he wants, even he can send the people who are in heaven, outside heaven. But, he says, But his gift, his grant is not stopped. It's not disconnected. This confirms that they are going to remain there. Because if they come out, it is majlud, it's stopped. So, he wants to say that they are going to remain in heaven, but if he wants, he can send them out. It's not that he is forced to keep them in heaven. You understand? He says, Ella ma sha'ara book. But again, he says, this is something which is not going to be stopped. So why Allah speaks in this way? He wants us to understand that at any time, under any circumstances, he is capable of doing what he wants. If he doesn't do something, it's because he doesn't want. Not that he wants, but he cannot do it. Do you understand? Yes. Yes. Maybe some of what well as are eternal. So the problem with the soul. Samawat wal ard, if they are eternal, then there is no need to say Khaladina fiha madamat as samawat wal ard. No, if you say Abadan is good, but madamat as samawat wal ard is not a good emphasis. And also, there seems to be no such heavens and the earth there. Yoma tabaddalus samawat. This system will stop. All these stars and planets, all will crash, all will stop. And if there is going to be heaven or, you know, earth, it would be new type, not this one. And Shaqqat al sama or for example, the sama on Fatarat, Kawakibu, in Tatharat, all these will stop. You are speaking about uh, heaven and hell. And this is uh, this condition uh, is about before heaven and hell. Uh, okay, that 
that is uh, something that we need to discuss. What does it mean, Khaladina fiha madamat asamwa? I have my own opinion, but I don't want to say before you study. If you want to study this, next week we can discuss. What does madamat asamawat wal ard mean? Because during Barzakh, there is time, but after the day of judgment, there is no time. There is no sky, there is no sun, there is no moon after the day of judgment. What does it mean, Madamat as Samawat wal Ard? I have a humble view, but if you want, you study this verse and then next week, inshallah, we can talk about it. Yes. Which scholar says this, that you should interpret one verse regardless of the rest of the Qur'an? Not regardless, in regard to each situation. Maybe okay, each but, situation but then, has really, has really okay, has you have to understand that verse, but also in the light of other verses of the Qur'an. You cannot just pick up one verse and interpret. Al-Qur'an, yufassaru ba'dhu ba'dha, yashhadu ba'dhu ala ba'dha. Definitely, you have to consider the whole Qur'an in order to understand every single verse. I don't think there are two positions here. No one says that, no, you can just take one ver verse of the Qur'an and understand it. All verses of the Qur'an must be studied together. And therefore, it needs familiarity with the Qur'an. Some people pick up Qur'an and use translation of the Qur'an or, you know, some books of tafsir, and they think they can interpret the Qur'an. This is not possible. One of the achievements of Allah in Al-Mizan was that he was able to bring all these verses together because he was very familiar with the Qur'an and because he had systematic approach. When he comes to Shafa'ah, he has a system in his mind. There are people who don't have system. Today they say something, tomorrow they say something else. If, for example, today we have some problem in society, they say this is the most important problem in human life. Tomorrow we have another problem. They say this is the most important. <laughs> because they don't have system. But Allah may have system in his mind. Also sometimes they are, for example, with a slot like Deda and something like that. And you are saying that it is Deda. But maybe we can consider each uh, you know, ayah with this uh, situation that it has revealed. Maybe it uh, could help us more than that we can. Uh, Even for that, you have to consider all Quran. Like the issue of abrogation. The, there are many has in the Quran there is Am and Khas, there is Nasikh and Mansukh. So you have to bring all the verses together so that you realize this verse is abrogated or abrogating. If you take just one verse, you don't realize that this is abrogated or abrogating or none of them. You have to bring all the verses together. You have to have a holistic approach. To the Quran, this holistic approach is very important. Yes. Allah Taala, as you said, has mentioned, we help each other in this for for something, for money, for something. Mm. As you know, why we can't help each other in hereafter? For example, a mom can help his son, her son, uh, because he, he she loves him. He uh, she, she let him, instead of his son, her son can go to hell, and his son and her son can go to the even uh, to the heaven 
So it's possible because it's not possible. I I want I want <laughs> I want to help my son. So it's oh, good. It's no, reasonable. No, uh, maybe we can send you both to hell. <laughs> <laughs> If you, if, if, if you insist, if you insist, <laughs> <laughs> you know, a person who has no faith and no good quality, how can you send him to heaven? Because he, uh, Allah says, it's, that, it's like what? It's like, for example, we have a very good professor, the best professor of mathematics. He says, you know, I am getting old, you know, I am going to retire. So please, instead of me, take my son and make him a member of the society of mathematicians. Can we do that? So we have the same situation about the intercession because this person is no. not good. What for the prophet was? Yes, yes we will explain. Like we will explain. In the case of Shafa'a, we don't take someone who is uh, absolutely, you know, empty from that quality. He must have something. So if someone doesn't know mathematic mathematics, he's not a mathematician. We cannot make him a member. But maybe a person knows to some extent, but he's not the best. We can help him. So Shafa'a is not arbitrary. This is what we are going to explain, inshallah. Shafa'a works for the people who have achieved to some extent. They need help. Like a teacher... When he finds that this student has worked, he has studied hard, but now one question, he doesn't get the answer properly. So he may help give him some, you know, assistance or a little, you know, extra mark. But someone who has never come to a school and has never, you know, opened the book, never studied, so in the this, teacher cannot help him. So in this case, all moms and fathers can help is, uh, their um, uh, children because their children are not absolutely bad. They have some capacity. Yeah, that, is so what, uh, can... that is what we had in Haram last week. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that uh, 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 two cases. One is وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَاتَّبَعَتْهُمْ ذُرِّيَّتُهُمْ بِإِيمَانٍ أَلْحَقْنَا بِهِمْ ذُرِّيَّتَهُمْ وَمَا أَلَتْنَاهُمْ مِنْ عَمَلِهِمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ But this is for وَاتَّبَعَتْهُمْ ذُرِّيَّتُهُمْ بِإِيمَانٍ If father is pious, his children are mu'min but not at his level, Allah lets them join that father without reducing the reward of that father. And I explained the hadith in Haram that hadith says that he would say to Allah, Amel to leave Allahum. Whatever I have done, I have done for myself and them. Then Allah says, Okay, let them share with him without reducing his reward. They don't divide it. Or in the prayer of angels who carry divine throne, they say, Adhilhum. Not every person who is just a child. So there must be some similarity. But maybe not identical. They are not exactly the same. But similarity. So a mu'min can help his children. But, as but as if they are also mu'min. Because because this person well, he's going to be, to go to the hell, so it's not so so good. Because he's going to go to go to hell. I have some intercession about him, so he's not good. <laughs> okay, if he goes to hell because he has no iman, you cannot help him. Yes, sure. But if he's going to hell because his good actions are not enough, he has iman, but his good actions are not enough. Then you can help him. So his, his bad actions are more. Because not, he's going to go to hell. <laughs> either his bad actions are more or his good actions are not enough. In any case, he has the basic requirements. He has Iman. Yes. Iman billah wal yawm al akhir. These are very important. If someone doesn't have Iman, no one can help him. Even 
the, for example, Prophet Nuh cannot help his son on the day of judgment. Yeah? Maybe, yeah. <laughs> no, definitely. He's not. Yeah, he cannot help his son because he was covered. In this world, yes, but in that world, we don't know. <laughs> exactly. In, in that world, it's the same. Indeed, in this world, in this world, he offered him help. In that world, even he cannot offer help. <laughs> because it's based on realities. In the, you cannot say just because he's my son, I... Okay. Yes. Because this is one book and it doesn't uh, undertake to discuss every issue in one place. Quran is not a book which says, okay, we have one chapter on Bani Israel. One chapter, for example, on Muslims, one chapter on resurrection, one chapter on justice, and everything is in that chapter. The way Quran speaks is that it speaks about everything in different places. If you want to understand the Quranic view about something, you have to bring them together. And this is also clearly said in the hadith of the Prophet and Imams. That Quran, yufassaru ba'duhu ba'da. Also the Quran itself says that some verses of the Quran are ummul kitab and some verses are to uh, be understood according to ummul kitab. So it's very clear, the Quran itself, the teachers of the Quran, and even if you yourself are familiar with the Quran, you realize that this is the method of Quran. Quran doesn't discuss one issue in one place and then says, okay, this is finished, we go to another issue. Quran wants you to be always thinking of the whole Quran. This is one of the beauties of the Quran. That the Quran says, if you want me, you have to read me from the beginning to the end. I don't accept you just knowing me in one part or few parts. The whole Quran must be together. Yeah. And they come they come to Bible, they say, okay, Bible here says this, and then and then after a few pages says to them that. So it is contradictory. There are some contradictions in Bible. But if if those two places which look contradictory if they can be put together under one explanation, so they are not contradictory. Yes, I accept. If it is possible to put them together. But sometimes it's not possible. For example, if in one place it says that God created the world in, for example, I'm saying, Six days in another places, for example, seven days. Six and seven, you cannot find, you know, a solution. But there are many things that can be put together if we want to reconcile. So we have to be fair. For example, there are some verses that talk about God as someone who has physical body. Yeah, but in some places talks about God as someone who has nobody. So we can put them together like the Quran when Allah says, Yadullah fawqa aidihim. And he says, Laysa ka shay. So we understand that Yadullah is not physical hand. But if it says that, for example, God was wrestling with someone, then it's very difficult to find an explanation for that. 
Okay. If it is possible, okay, no problem. We don't want to emphasize, emphasize on problem, but if it's possible. If someone says, for example, God was defeated, or for example, God was eating or drinking, or God came you know, to the earth uh, physically, it seems it's not possible to reconcile. If it is possible, no problem. We have to be fair and we have to be trying to find excuses for people. In the Oz and the Kerama and Nas Makabul. Not having double standards. Yeah, yeah. We have to avoid this. This is me as, for example, they use different kinds of interpretation for, for example, justifying the words. For example, they use operation, they use, uh, for example, I don't know, uh, mysticism and different kinds of sciences that say that they don't have any contradictory with each other. Mm -hmm. It's possible, as my brother told, you know, at the first view we can see that we cannot, you know, come with each other. But after, you know, a little bit same thing, we can use mysticism, operation, and different method for interpreting this verse, this different kind of verse. Yeah, if possible, yes. But it must be in the way that they themselves also accept. Not that you justify for them something that they don't accept themselves. My brother mentioned, in this way we can interpret Bible too. Yeah. Different parts of Bible we can interpret. You know, we can, for example, interpret Trinity in the way which doesn't have problem. Even Trinity can be interpreted, in the way, but do they accept the same thing or not? That's another issue. Because you can say that Trinity is just manifestations of God, not three gods. But do they accept this or not? That is another issue. Indeed, sometimes I think that if a good, uh, you know, Muslim scholar writes Christian theology, can write it much better than many of the Christians. Because Alhamdulillah, we have, you know, a skills and system. And I think if we write a theology for them, it would be very strong, much stronger than some of the theology that they have written. Pardon? <laughs> yes. But then the problem is that whether they accept or not. This is the <laughs> Yes. There's a difference between the examples you mentioned because you said uh, one, one contradiction is where the topic is contradictory, but one example, one contradiction is like when you say something and then you say completely opposite in the same sentence. So for example, we say nobody has even read, and then someone else say um, somebody can have even read. That's a contradictory sentence. It's not contradictory. Where is it? It is. It's like I changed my mind. Or no, no. When he says no one has El Mulgayb, means independently. When he says some people have El Mulgayb, means depending on God. You have to master the language of the Quran. This is the way the Quran speaks. Many verses of the Quran, if you take them uh, disconnected from the rest of the Quran, you will misunderstand. For example, the verses about free will. Some verses denies free will. If you take them separately, you think that we have no choice. ما تشاؤون إلا أن يشاء الله ما رميت إذ رميت. But we know that in some other verses Allah says that there is free will. إن هديناه السبيل إما شاكرا وإما كفورا. So we have to put these verses together. And then we would have the. And as I said, Allah Himself says that. منه آيات محكمات وآخر متشابهات. Those محكمات are mother of the book, and متشابهات are to be understood in the light of محكمات. And indeed, 
it seems that muhkamat are not fixed. My understanding is this. You first have few muhkamat, then with the help of them, you understand some mutashabat, and then they become muhkam. Then you can build upon them and understand other mutashabahat. At the end, inshallah, no mutashabah remains. Yeah, because it's Kitab Mubin. But it's like a puzzle. You know, it's like a puzzle. At the beginning, everything looks, you know, confusing. First, you find some clear pieces. You put them, then with the help of them, you put other pieces of puzzle, then all becomes clear. And that is when you become ar rasikhun then these are the people who can interpret. Yes. What uh, my brother is trying to say is uh, which way should the Quran uh, speaks into that we can say that it could be a sort of uh, contradiction. Okay? So because the Holy Quran says it could not be the, it does not contradict one uh, part of the Quran with the other parts. So. Which way should Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or in which way should Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talk into that we can say that it could have been a contradictory, but it did, it did not say If there is no jame or fi, this is very important. Jame or fi. Sometimes I say that it, it could be, you know, I think it's a sort of self defining, self to define contradictions. We Muslims, okay, we uh, define contradiction in a way that it cannot be applicable on, or, on the Holy Quran or other, some, some maybe some sources. Okay, but the, the other, the others, I mean, for example, the outsiders of Islam, they do not live in this definition of... Uh, no, no, anything which is jama or fi means that the common sense view accepts it as a conclusion, then it's acceptable. If it is not jam, so amu khas, mutlaq muqayyad, nasikh mansukh. These are something that are common. But if there is tabayun, this is not acceptable. Yes. Sir. Pardon. For example, we, in Quran we have about uh, Adam and Eve. We have fatashqa. Okay. Like Zolimin. So we just we justify. No. Zolimin, Ashqab. And it's not common in Arab. Even in Arab culture, it's not common. It's not common. Arab. Zolimin and Ashqab is not, it's not our goal. No, no. No, no. Zolim doesn't mean that he has committed legal sin. Everything we have to discuss it in its own place. But we never, we never say something which doesn't make sense in Arabic. At least I don't say anything which doesn't make sense in Arabic or just because it is Qur'an. Always, whatever we say must be something that we can say it with regards to other things as well. We have to be fair and we have to be uh, always avoiding, you know, biasness. Biasness is not good. Anything that you say, if it doesn't make sense in Arabic, you have to reject it. It must make sense in that language because Allah has spoke to us in Arabic language. If you want to manipulate the language, it doesn't work. But Alhamdulillah, we don't have such thing. But if you find, we can discuss. Yes. Yeah. Which book, for example? This book. <laughs> no, this book is just today we had a mistake. No, actually, not 
<laughs> Which book is free from mistakes? <laughs> no. Empty of mistake. Indeed. Indeed, let me tell you something. Indeed, if there is a book like Nahjul Balaghe or Sahif or these type of things that look also consistent, it is because of the Quran. Anything good in Nahjul Balaghe is because of Quran, because of Allah's guidance. If Imam Ali wants to have something from himself as a person, it wouldn't become like natural balagha. His honor is that he is a student of the Quran. Where? <laughs> yeah, they make all the mistakes. Yeah. In one value, we cannot find several mistakes. Maybe it is going to be changed. You, you cannot find any human product without mistakes. Even sometimes you yourself, when you write a book, then you find many problems in the book. No, it depends who is finding the errors. If someone in a same level of knowledge is looking for errors, he finds few errors. If someone who is in high level of knowledge, looks for errors, he finds many errors. Especially you must imagine that this book is compiled in 23 years and addresses many, many issues. It's not a book which is written in few months about one topic. A book which is compiled in 23 years and about many, many issues. This makes it very, very difficult. You cannot find any human work which is addressing such a wide range of topics in 23 years without lots of problems. If you find, you can show. About religion, for example, Allah yeah, so it must be something that addresses many issues, okay? But if they don't address many issues, uh, still they would have problems, shortcomings. You see, for example, the textbooks that they write for universities. Although they are textbooks, so they don't address very, you know, delicate issues. Every year or every few years they change. Big universities publish dictionaries. Every few years, they have to change. They make, you know, amendments. So, even if it is one subject, it doesn't remain intact. Even, you know, books like Masnavi by Rumi, who is a student of Quran and Islam, still you can find problems in them. There are some areas that he has made mistakes. We have it. Quran is going to be revealed in this year and in this age. It will, it will be the same as the Quran which was revealed 400 years ago. It was probably about in this time. If it was supposed to be revealed in this time, but it's not supposed to be revealed now. <laughs> so this question yes. is not uh, applicable today. The best thing that Allah, you know, has spoke to humanity is this Quran. It's not that if Allah had uh, waited for a few more centuries, he would have spoken better. 
So I'm saying the best time and the best way to speak to humanity occurred at that particular time. Yeah. Yeah. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not deprive human beings who are in need of guidance by choosing a wrong time. If he's wise, a wise person chooses the best means and the best times. It's a miscalculation that you choose a time that you cannot give everything to humanity. No, no. He didn't try his best. He, he doesn't need to try. He knew that this is the best time, the best opportunity to address humanity by giving them the final message. It was not difficult for him. He knew this. If Allah had wanted to, to lead and to guide people more than what he had done and what he had happened, would it be possible or not? No, th there, is, there is nothing more than this. You don't need till end of dunya anything more than Quran. This is okay because Allah doesn't want to force what He offers as a guide. He offers. You can take it, you can reject it. What He offers is given to us in the best way, it is Quran. No one can say, Oh Allah, if you had sent us a better book, I would have been guided. No. This is sufficient for all generations to come. We don't need anything more than Quran. Indeed, indeed, for most of us, Quran is more than enough. <laughs> Quran is for very few people. You know, like for example, uh, if you have 100 students, for 80 of them, even the last version is enough. But because there are 10, 20 very intelligent, sharp people, you send them a new version. Many human beings, I think for them, even Torah or Injil was enough. Because that's the book of guidance and light. But because Allah wants to raise the level of perfection for humanity, because there are people in Akhir zaman who can understand better and who can be in higher levels, Allah sent the Quran. Okay, we will continue inshallah next week. Wa akhirul da'wan and alhamdulillah rabbil